you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Hello everybody, today you find me well and truly out of my depth, for I am driving a 1991 Toyota Carina 2, 1.6, Windsor, R. The reason I'm driving this car today is the same reason as to why its owners bought it. Why not? In all honesty, on a beautifully sunny but very brisk British spring morning, this is actually not a bad car to be driving around because it's the sort of thing you can really enjoy without going quickly at all. That's just as well because with barely 80 horsepower under the bonnet, this car has many things quick is not one of them. I'm now going to try and tell you a little bit about the Carina 2, but I'm hoping someone out there watching knows a lot more than I do and will be able to fill in the blanks down in the comments section. The Carina is a small Japanese saloon car that was in production from 1970 to 2001. For the first decade and a half or so, it was spun off the Celica platform. Then, around 1984, it started to use the slightly larger Corona as the donor car. The Corona is another one of these allegedly legendary nameplates I'd never heard of, having been in production from 1957 to 2001. But if it ever was sold here, I certainly wasn't around to remember it. What's really confusing is that here in Britain, for a number of years, we got this, the Carina 2, which was actually a rebadged version of the full-sized Corona, unlike the Carina, which was actually a different enough car to genuinely justify a different nameplate. Further confusing matters is the fact that the Carina and Corona nameplates were themselves replaced by a whole bunch of different cars, and the direct successor to the Carina or Corona was dictated more by which body style it was that you've been purchasing. The two cars you're likely to have heard of that replaced these were the Caldina and the much more successful Avensis. There were two other models that I think really were more Japan-only items, one being I think the Allion and the other I forget entirely. Though I believe these sold reasonably well in their day, trying to find information on the Carina 2 now was nearly impossible. Here's what I definitely know. Up front, you will find a 1.6 litre Toyota 4A engine. This is a relative of the fabled 4A GE that you'd find in the Sprinter Torino, the high revving spicy lump that powers everybody's favorite tofu delivery vehicle. This one is still 16 valve as the badging everywhere is keen to remind you, but is far more modest in its power output. The gents who own this car tell me it's around 90 horsepower, but the internet tells me it's more like 80. Carina 2 experts, if you can tell us who's right, we would be very appreciative. I went through my old stack of auto car magazines and picked out a copy from 1990 to see if it would shed any more light on this car, and I found two interesting facts. First off, one of these new was around ten and a half thousand pounds. That made it about the same money as a sort of mid-level Golf, a reasonably nicely specified Austin Maestro, and it was actually cheaper than any Saab in production at the time. What was particularly notable was the warranty, and this is something that us modern types tend to forget. You see, the majority of manufacturers at the time didn't really give you all that much. You bought a new Volkswagen, you got one year's worth. Ford, one year's worth. Even Volvo, one year's worth. Honda only gave you two, as did Porsche. But Toyota would give you three years of unlimited mileage warranty. The only other manufacturers at the time doing the same I could find were Rolls-Royce and Bentley, then the same company, and weirdly, Alfa Romeo. There is, unsurprisingly, a very simple reason why Toyota was so happy to offer their cars with such an extensive warranty, and that's because they didn't really break. 
Consumer reports of the time found that these cars were, on average, twice as reliable as the Vauxhall equivalent. In one survey of four-year-old Carina 2s, it was found that only five in 1,000 suffered from a breakdown. This car is owned by a pair of gentlemen who each have a half share in it, and they're both, surprisingly, in their mid-twenties. They picked it up at an auction because they were on the hunt for something a little bit different and unusual. I would say with this, they've certainly found that. They do drive more modern cars as well, but they've also got some other interesting stuff, so they have a share in a Mark III Capri, and they've also got an early MX-5 as well. This car is currently pretty much standard. The auto car issue that I dragged out made absolutely no mention of what the Windsor trim gave you. We believe the wing at the back could be part of it, and I have a suspicion that in terms of downforce, that's not really doing all that much. Looks a little bit sporty though, and they have plans to turn this into what you'd consider a proper sleeper. Because the benefit of having a 4A engine in here is that you can put in another 4A engine. And they've already bought a version of the legendary 4A GE Silvertop, a 20 valve item which apparently is currently set up for 160 horsepower. That is fuel injected rather than the carburation that you'll find here. That's one of the reasons for its greater power and that means that although mechanically it will fit in the car without really any trouble, electronically there will be some work to be done. This car also has an old school alarm system in it, the classic bunch of million keys that come with every old car, and a mystery switch down here whose purpose we are unaware of. At the moment, it is riding on the original 13-inch steel wheels, two of which still have their hubcaps, and I have to say, Dylan was not lying when he told me this is one of the most comfortable cars you will ever experience. However, as I am a dedicated petrol head and I find myself on a little slice of British toge, I suppose it would only be culturally appropriate to give the car what for and see how she performs in the twisty stuff. Son of Sprinter, this is not. It's a car clearly designed for pottering about in. It will move if you tell it to, but the steering is very slow. Talks to you just a little bit, but only enough to say, go away. But the biggest issue is the fact that over some reasonably undemanding sections of road, I think the suspension is completely running out of travel because it gave me a couple of fairly nasty knocks while I was driving. My foot currently is welded, we're doing 53 mile an hour, 55, there's the speed limit, and a lorry's coming, excellent, what are you doing out on a Sunday? Rev matching is actually really quite easy, rev matching is actually really quite easy, but heel and toe is not, because the pedals are simply too far apart. Visibility, as you'd expect with a car of this age, is absolutely excellent. The throttle, brake, clutch, all fairly light. Oh, yeah, that, that's not nice. Throttle, brake and clutch, they're all pretty good. And the electronics in this car all still work. It's got a sunroof, that works. It's got windows, they work. Wing mirrors, they're not electric, they're old school, but they work. There are no warning lights on the dash. The temperature is set absolutely perfect. Even the little old school quartz clock here looks absolutely pristine. This car was being sold as part of a clear out from a gentleman's estate. This is exactly the kind of car you could see that some old boy has had from new or nearly new and simply taken it to the shops and back, serviced it when he needed and everything else. It even came with some original paperwork, including pricing for all of the components. And one thing we did notice is that not many of them are actually that cheap. My first instinct is to say that it doesn't feel especially upmarket in here. The truth is, it's actually pretty good. Not only does everything still work, all the materials are still exactly where they should be, headroom is a little bit limited, I will confess, and taller drivers I think wouldn't get on with this. I'm 5'10 and up front it's okay, but in the back I do have to hunch down a little bit. 
The heater controls are elegant in their simplicity and it even has an original specification Toyota cassette radio. The gearbox, perhaps unsurprisingly for a Toyota, is a real highlight. It's got a beautiful action to it, is light but accurate, with a throw that's not as long as you might expect, and five ratios, which at the time wouldn't have been considered the norm for all brands. Despite being a UK market car, this was still of the era where the indicators were on the right-hand side. I have to say, I prefer them there. Despite its modest power figure, I would say the car never really feels like it's struggling. I suppose I should remind myself that even if we take the more pessimistic figure of around 80 horsepower, that was still a fair amount compared to many other cooking cars of the late 80s. And the whole car weighs only around a ton. Get it to 4,000 RPM, and it even sounds good too. The chaps who own this do know what they're about to commit is borderline sacrilege when you've got a car that's as rare as one of these. Because of said rarity, they're pretty hard to find an accurate price for. This one, they paid 1,500 quid. There are a couple others up for sale, one around similar money, and one around 3,000 pounds that is what you might describe as a much better example. This one has a few patches of corrosion that are very much working their way through. The boot floor had to be replaced, for which they actually, rather resourcefully, used a bonnet from another car that was mostly destined for the scrap heap anyway. The boot is actually a pretty good size too, meaning if you did want to try and use something like this as a classic daily, it's actually reasonably well suited. There was an automatic available, it was another £943, and power steering was standard. Other models in the lineup did exist, both above and below this, in terms of trim and engine. I don't believe there ever was a hot version of this car from factory, but the truth is it's not actually the engine which really lets it down in performance terms anyway. If you wanted this to go faster, the bit I'd start with, and what I shall tell the guys when I get back, is the suspension. The wheels are being changed, as are the brakes, but their intention is to create a true sleeper and therefore leave the cosmetics as alone as they possibly can. That, I think, though, is about all I really have to tell you about this 1991 Toyota Carina 2. Like I said at the start, if you happen to know an awful lot more than me, which I don't think is particularly difficult with this thing, hop into the comment section down below, share your knowledge with the world. It'll be a very, very useful thing to have, especially if I'm able to revisit this car or one like it in the near future. For now, though, I want to say a huge thank you to Dylan and George for bringing their car out, to you for watching, and as ever, please like, Comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.